colored uh, with a yellow ribbon and uh, it's actually essential because it's a documentation of everything she does and uh, and uh, it's indispensable and there's not been a reason to bag up of it so if you come across a little silver USB thing that would uh, really be uh, warmly appreciated not only by Maria but also for the rest of us because we have to to compensate <laughs> for, uh, when, when she cannot work and that's much too much for us. Uh, okay, thank you. That was... Uh, <coughs> now I pass uh, the, the uh, uh, microphone over to another Jens, our Swedish Jens, Jens Allen. Uh, in order to ensure complete objectivity, it's a Swede who has made the Danish benchmarking and I that, guess that's why we fell below Norway. Um, but uh, yes, uh, together with uh, Christina, uh, uh, made uh, the, the benchmarking of the Danes and uh, uh, will uh, take us through the next uh, debate about uh, whether uh, soft law, hard law is uh, the best way. Like a very fitting continuation of what we just talked about before the coffee break. And we will finish at seven, uh, sorry, at 17 uh, at five o'clock. A shout it because there are a number of airplanes and things that have to be uh, called. Thank you, Jens. Uh, welcome back uh, from the coffee break. As Jens already mentioned, um, I'm Jens Al, uh, done the Danish part of the Danish Ghost Study. And uh, in this session, we're going to talk about if hard or soft flow or a little bit of both are the best way to achieve better governance in sport. And first up to talk about this subject is uh, Marike Vloren, who's the president of the Jugo Hockey Federation and also member of the EXCO in International Hockey Federation and also member of the IOC uh, Women Commission. So the floor is yours, Marike. Thank you very much. Um... Let's start to introduce myself very briefly, because for a lot of you I'm a strange person and no idea about my background. Uh, my background is that I'm a master in law. Uh, I worked at the University of Leiden 12 years and I lectured labor law. I have a long time experience in hockey, not only in playing but also in volunteering, but also professional. I used to be director of KNHB, the Hockey Federation in Holland. Uh, and from that role, I started with Dutch respect programs. So I think it's also mentioned in your report that if you are involved in a sport, uh, that's for some people a kind of a religion, and you are able to convey also values to them. And that's a very important part of a sport, I think. <laughs> and uh, in the governance area, I used to be a member of the committee in 2005, Frank, of the uh, governance committee. I totally agree with you that it has to be modernized, different subjects and, and so on. Uh, but I'm now at the moment chair of the governance of FIH, and that's uh, our world organization, the world body, and I can tell you that's a challenge. Who is Europe Hockey Federation? We are 43 member associations, <coughs> more or less 1 million hockey players, so that's something. More than 2,000 volunteers. Our budget is around 1 million euro. We have an executive board with 12 persons, 4 women, 8 men, 6 staff members. Director General is our boss, 3, three men, women, and we have 10 committees and 35% of these committees are women. What are our key areas? What's where we are on this world? Of course, if you uh, start to be a part of, a, of an association, you are not doing that for nothing. In the area of hockey, you are doing it because you want to play hockey. So we as a European Hockey Federation have to offer hockey competitions, and that's what we are doing. We are doing at club level, at nations level, indoor, outdoor, we start at under 16, under 18, under 21, and seniors. And all these things together bring us to 34 tournaments a year. And this is possible because all the hosts offer their own volunteers to take care for the tournament. 
of course, we offer officials, we have a technical delegate, we offer the regulations, but they are doing the job. Next to the competitions is a part of our uh, uh, working field, development and education. So I think the solidarity aspects, the dimension in the report, I would say, is covered by this part. Because what we are doing is trying to educate empires, coaches and uh, officials. We are doing it in three tiers, all of them. So always the top level, the level below, who just didn't make it, and the level at national, uh, at the national level. Uh, we are very proud that we just have uh, uh, got two um, um, uh, Erasmus Plus uh, applications. One about uh, getting more volunteers through good governance. So actually, good governance is a, a way and, and uh, why we've got it. And the other one is to uh, get better playing fields, uh, better, better play on the field, I must say, by disruptive coaching skills. And disruptive seems to be a negative word but it just explains that it's not the way that has gone by everybody, it's new. For development, our Youth Leaders program is very important. We have every two years a Youth Leaders seminar and we try to educate our Youth Leaders between 15 and 30 uh, to get knowledge about all different areas, empowering, event management, communication, social media, etc. Actually, what you achieve is that you get friends for life. We have a give and get program, and that means that on our website people can offer, say, artificial pitches, kits, equipment, and other can ask for it. So there's a central place on the website that people can give things and other can get things, and it's just a kind of a, a marketplace. And a very important part for us is the para hockey. We call it para hockey. It disabled hockey, and disabled hockey for us means that we are specially orientated on mentally disabled. So these areas, it's what we are doing for. Of course, I'm here today for the uh, observer, national sport governance uh, observer, and I've read the dimensions and I've read the key factors, um, and I've gone through it and. Yeah, maybe I was a little bit too optimistic, optimistic, but I don't think that we are doing well. Uh, <coughs> but of course, if I would ask Arnaud, maybe you would have a different opinion. So maybe we can discuss once what a, uh, what's the reality. Um, now, of course, we have statutes, so you can find them on the website. Uh, we have a general assembly and the agenda published. We have our executive board members and the committees, and what we do, that seems to be quite special. After every board meeting, we uh, publish a bulletin, and also we publish our minutes. So if you go to eurohockey.org and you have a look under About Us, then you will find somewhere our minutes. So we try to be as open as possible. And we also have a page uh, totally dedicated to our member federations, because it's to them that we are there. Democratic process. We are elections. We uh, 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 elect our executive board and the president. We have secret ballots and we have scrutineers, always very important people during elections. We have term limits, but we have also age limits. And that is because we are following every age. We and ourselves are not in favor of age limits. And as a chair of the governance panel at my age, I've worked very hard the last year to get rid of the age limit, but that was too much for some conservative people who were very afraid that IOC wouldn't like it if we would have no age limit anymore. So we are following IOC in their age limit. By the way, IOC has no <coughs> term limit. Uh, we have every year a general assembly, and we as a board meet five times a year, but that's not the only time we meet. We meet also during tournaments, World Cup, European Cup, and so on. Checks and balances. We have an internal audit, and we have also an externally audit committee. Um, 
we have our regulations and in our regulations we are linked to the FIH so say that we have an outdoor tournament, we have outdoor regulations but the, is connected to the masters from FIH and through that masters document we have the integrity code from the FIH and we have an integrity unit and in the integrity code is uh, together the code of conduct, the, co the ethical code, the conflict of interest policy so that's all together through our regulations we are involved sorry, in the FIH. Of course we are uh, recognized in CAS um, and we are funding according to pre-established criteria. Yeah, the funding part is interesting. Um, we have a, a, a budget for development of budget <coughs> education and all our member associations know exactly uh, who's getting what and what they have to do to get it. But that's not published on the website, so that's maybe something that we can improve. Uh, solidarity, I think uh, a clear anti-discrimination uh, policy, it's in our statutes, it's already there. Uh, and we think that how we are uh, in trying to involve the disabled people, but also working on gender balance, is a kind of a solidarity program. And I'll come back on that, but that's something I like to change. So we see the good governance, the, the report as a benchmark, what are we doing well, what are we doing wrong. And of course the exercise in itself is nice, but we also understand it's not about exercise. It's about the reality that counts. Our approach in these things is that we think that we are positive, dynamic, we are working on dialogues, not telling top down, but working bottom up. <coughs> and what for us very important is that we are li give listening ears, that we really show that we listen to our people. And there we come to an <coughs> interesting part, that we are listening to our uh, national associations, but as you remember, we also have clubs and we also have players. And I think we can improve in that way. They are very important stakeholders for us. And that's something we have to work on, how we get their voice better in our uh, policy. And we have an open window. That's something we stress to each other every time. We are an association, we have members, we have clubs, we have players, but we are not a closed circle. We are living in the world and around us is happening a lot. And we have, we have to be aware that we have to take care for that and that we cannot ignore it. And if I think um, a little bit how I would uh, refer to the report in this case is that um, I've read some parts of it. For me the interesting part is what I have heard this afternoon also several times, the pointing finger. Uh, that maybe there was some surprise that everybody was very happy when we would come to the uh, to the national federations. Of course they are happy. Why not? There's nothing nothing to hide. Uh, I think everybody wants to improve. It's only the way you have to explain the things, the way you are supportive, that is for me very important. There's no no shame if you are doing things wrong. When I think what the guy from Cyprus just explained very well, indeed, say at 30 points or 30 percent, 30 I don't know exactly what it is, but it doesn't matter. They are working on it, they are improving, and I think you can be very proud of it if you are thinking about things and trying to improve. Now I come to hard law and soft law, that's the reason that I'm here. Uh, for me, yeah. Of course, hard law helps. If you have statutes, uh, then it's written in stone, I would say. You cannot deny your statutes. But still, it is not a guarantee. So, statutes or guidelines, it doesn't really matter to me, and I will try to explain why. Sport is a strange battlefield. Not only on the field of play, but also off the field of play. Uh, and when I started my career in the whole political area of the sport, uh, sometimes I was doubting what's going on here, especially with elections. 
um, when you are uh, standing for a function, you have no idea if you will be elected or not. Because people who are telling you that they will vote for you don't, and the other way around. And I know that I was asking somebody who was very uh, familiar with elections, so somebody from ASO, if he said, how do you know? How do you know that somebody will vote for you and or not? Now he told me, I've got a very wise lesson from Livingstone, the former uh, London mayor. He said, the diff difference between politics and sport is, in politics, if you say you will vote for somebody, you do. In sports, if you say you will vote for somebody, 50% of them will do. So you need always to have a fast majority in advance to be sure you will be elected. And that gives a feeling of insecurity, especially because you don't ex uh, expect it from the sport. You are there together, you have the same goal, uh, you, you pretend that people are honest to you, but that's not always the case. And that's also in other areas. If you have a kind of guidelines, you have uh, uh, statutes or whatever laws there are, at the moment they need to be executed, then you see differences. And the differences are depending on the people who are executed. And that's exactly what you have tried, must try to prevent. The differences depending on people. And how you can do it? For me, I don't know. The only thing you can do is my, my, my uh, convincement is that you can be a, a role model. You need to show that you are doing it in a fair way and you have to inspire everybody around you. One extra uh, remark about the report, uh, about two indicators I would like to add uh, to the dimensions you can make better uh, say is inclusivity and also gender balance. I think really that if you want to do something for gender balance, then it's important that you make it really very important and that it's supported by men and women. And that brings me to gender balance. There was a question to me, what do you think? Is it important that we have numbers, that we have quota, that it's all there? I doubt. I'm more or less a person of, uh, uh, indeed, inspiration, convincement, but no rules. But I have to admit, if in the end it's not working, we have to start somewhere. So yes, maybe. But I'm still in the inspirational uh, form, phase, I would say. I believe that we have to approach gender balance as a strategy. A strategy is important is for men and women. And that we have to be, make the people around us aware that it is important. That if one of us is there, that's not better than we would be there together. Because we are equal, but it's something else than that we are not different, because we are different. And I see it every day, with all kinds of things I talk to people, the approach is different. And coming back, for example, on elections or in asking people for a committee. If I ask women, then it's always the first reaction is, I don't know, I don't know if I can, I don't know if I can combine with my work at home, with my family, but I, if I ask a man, <coughs> oh, it's a good idea. No, no problem. Never, never asking if he could do it or not. But I also see when I talk to men about it that they're always a little bit, no, not all, not all, but uh, some of them are a little bit, yeah, hesitating. Is it needed? I said, yes, just look around. <coughs> see what's going on. Read the paper. It is needed because it's really <coughs> the majority of men in all these things. And I don't know if you've seen last weekend the picture of the board of the EOC. I think there are. 40 men and two women. It's, it, it's a disaster in my view. <laughs> and maybe it helps two men to think about it that if you have daughters, or maybe your granddaughters, it would be lovely for them if they get the same chances as you, of course. And that in the end, they can do with other people what you have done with a lot of men. It's important that if you want to have women involved, not only inspire them, but also <coughs> give attention to them. That means that you have to 
prepare, if you want somebody to ask for something. And not in between, not, hey, yes, I've seen you here, very nice, is something for you. No, think about it. And the moment you ask, think about it. And ask again. And then at a certain moment, women realize it's true. Do it on time, so not two weeks before the elections, but maybe a year before. And it takes time. Just visit and uh, look around and tell why you think a woman is okay. I think we really need to work on it. It's all better for all of us. And I think if it's a one of the dimensions in the sports observer, then it will help. And then we can test and ask people what they're doing. We have to do it together. We have to give it hands and feet. I think I've heard it also before. Not only talking the talk, but walking the walk is where it's about. It's not only about regulation things, it's just how we are executing it. And IOC Women in Sport did something wonderful a year ago. They came forward with 25 recommendations. And the good thing of this recommendation is that they very well specified in what areas we can do what. We all would recognize it, and I think it can be a help to change things and maybe to use as key indicators. We need mentors. It would be lovely <coughs> if all the men in this audience would be mentors just to help the women to get it done. And maybe the best reason to do it, that I really think without gender balance, there is no good governance. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Leike, for the interesting presentation. And next up, to give her perspective on how to achieve the better governance in sport, is Senior Governance uh, Manager Emma Fallow from UK Sport, an uh, organization that introduced a uh, governance code two years ago. And I'm really looking forward to hear, hearing about uh, uh, that process. Yes, ma'am. told you a little bit about UK sports and what we do. Uh, we are the United Kingdom's elite sports agency and we distribute national lottery and exchequer income into, to support elite athletes and national governing bodies of sport. My role is to support those national governing bodies to achieve the highest standards of governance uh, and to drive uh, world leading uh, standards of professional, organisational and ethical conduct. Together with Sport England, I was a key member of the team in the creation of a code for sports governance. So where did it all start? We launched the code back in October 2016, but it was prompted by our government's new strategy for sport, Sporting Future, which was, had been published the year before. In that strategy, our government had tasked both UK Sport and Sport England with agreeing this new code for sports governance. And they were clear that all parts of the sports and physical activity landscape must adhere to this code if they wanted to receive <coughs> public funding. The code does set some high standards, but our aim was that it be simple and easy to use. So the code has three tiers of compliance to ensure proportionality across the different investments made by UK sport, while consistent, maintaining consistency across all funded activity. <coughs> the tiers are categorised by the size and the length of the investment that we make. So tier three is um, our highest level in the code. It's aimed at helping organisations become better governed 
and therefore more commercially viable and attractive to potential investors. Investments are generally over a million euros and we invest over a longer period of time. Uh, here, all of the code's 58 requirements are applicable. And then at the other end of the scale, we have tier one. This is our lowest level of compliance in the code. It's there really to ensure that public money is protected, but it's realistic on expectations on smaller organisations. Investments are normally one-offs, and they're less than 250,000 euros. Under a tier one, the types of requirements that we'd ask for boards is that they be properly constituted, inclusive, have good decision-making processes, they're open and accountable, and they have sound financial processes in place. And then lastly, we have tier two, which is somewhere in the middle. So these are typically big one-off investments, or they might be the start of a new ongoing relationship between us and a sport. Investments in this tier will range between 250 and 1 million euros. And under a tier 2, we'd ask for all of the requirements that were in tier 1 and then some bespoke requirements from tier 3. So the code has five principles in total, um, and I'd like to take you through each of them in turn. So starting with principle 1, structure. Directors are uh, collectively responsible for the long-term success of an organisation and therefore it's appropriate that the ultimate authority rests with them. The requirements under this principle in the code state that the board should be responsible for setting an organisation strategy. But to do this effectively you need to have the right people sitting around the table. They need to have the right composition. The board should be made up of no more than 12 directors and director's terms must be for periods of three or four years, and no director should be allowed to sit on a board for more than nine years in total. Principle two looks at people. So it's recognised that diverse, skilled and experienced boards, which contain independent voice, and which engage in constructive, open debate, enable optimum decision making. The requirements under this principle address areas such as diversity, independence, skills, and how directors are recruited onto the board. The code sets targets of 30% of each gender on the board, and there's an aspiration to achieving gender parity and greater diversity generally. We state that there should be at least 25% independent non-executive directors and that all board appointments should be made on merit through an open and transparent skills, uh, sorry, recruitment process which is led by a nominations committee. So principle three is communication. The code expects organisations to be transparent about why they exist, what it is that they're trying to do and how are they doing it. This allows for accountability and empowers stakeholders by giving them the information that they need on that organisation. The requirements under this principle request certain disclosures of standing information on an organisation's website, such as the annual report on accounts, key outputs and results from areas such as finance and governance, and details about the progress being made in an organisation's strategy. Principle four, standards and conduct. Having the right values embedded in the culture of an organisation helps to protect public investment, but it also enhances the reputation of the organisation, earning stakeholder trust. The code sets requirements such as internal and external board evaluations. Evaluations will assist with continuous improvement um, which will help inform skills assessments and succession planning off the board. Conflicts of interest policies. This ensures that boards are acting in the best interest of the organisation and that decisions are not being unduly influenced. And we ask that all boards will have a director's code of conduct. 
This requires that the director acts with integrity and in a forthright and ethical manner. And then the last principle is principle five, and this looks at policies and procedures. <coughs> Understanding the legal environment and having in place appropriate financial and other controls helps mitigate risk and again will enhance stakeholder trust. This principle deals with the legal, regulatory and compliance policies, processes and procedures a well-governed organisation should have in place, including financial controls and risk management, and those with a particular importance to the sporting landscape, such as those regarding elite athletes and safeguarding. Okay, so I've taken you through the code. Um, I'd now like to tell you about how we as a governance team at UK Sports and Sports England rolled out the code and our implementation process that we followed. So governance managers offered initial phone calls uh, to answer any top level questions that sports may have had since you launched the code. We then scheduled face-to-face -face meetings with every single one of our funded bodies uh, to discuss the code in detail with them and to take them through what the code really meant to them. The governance team completed desktop, as desktop assessments for each sport um, against all of the code's 58 requirements. Uh, these assessments were based on the information and records that UK Sport held, recent audit reports of the sports and any self-assurance documents, the organisation's articles and any other constitutional documents and published information on the organisation's website. We then held those face-to-face -face meetings with our sports and took them through our first draft assessment up to tell them where we thought they stood against the code's requirements and what actions they would need to take in order for them to become fully compliant. Following these meetings, we finalised our assessments based on the discussions that we'd had with our sports and then as a team we went through a process of moderation where we compared how each funded body would address areas of non-compliance, we set default actions and time frames to be included in the governance action plans <coughs> along with any bespoke approaches for organisations that had unique circumstances. And then finally we issued and formally agreed the bespoke governance action plans for each and every one of our funded organisations. During this time, we also offered a full support package to our funded sports. Uh, where they had to um, implement and undertake the significant task of achieving the changes required by the code. So this support ranged from providing technical support and advice, to sourcing legal advice in connection with the drafting of article changes, and professional advice in areas such as developing, uh, developing diversity. Sports were given six months to achieve compliance with the code. These time frames were driven by our government who saw this as a real priority area. And there was some concerns from our sports over the amount of time that they had in order to become compliant with the code. But generally speaking, sport was in a good place um, and the code <coughs> really looked to just enhance some of the already good practice that existed. I'm really proud to say that, and, and look back and reflect on what the sector achieved, we did it. Um, all, every single one of our funded organisations is fully compliant with the Code for Sports Governance. It's a massive undertaking. <sighs> However, um, it's not just about achieving compliance with the Code. Through our funding agreements, uh, sports are required to maintain their compliance and any non-compliance will be treated as a breach of our funding agreements with them. The sports councils have been clear about their willingness to withdraw funding as a consequence of non-compliance. But in the event that non-compliance is determined, <coughs> excuse me, organisations will be given a right of remedy whereby an associated set of remedial actions will be determined and communicated 
which must be satisfactorily completed within a period of time. Since the production of the code, there is no <coughs> question that it's been transformational. The UK sports sector has shown measurable and sustainable improvements in governance. It's generated great interest, great interest both nationally and internationally. We are working with a number of partners, including sports, other governments, international organisations such as the Council of Europe, to further strengthen governance and international sport. It's been a real pleasure to meet you all today and to share with you our story. Thank you. Thank you, Emma. Uh, next up is uh, Paolo Ottenello, uh, Policy Officer at the Sport Unit at the EU Commission. Welcome. Thank you. So, uh, who am I? Some of you know me for my role uh, working in gender equality in sport. That has been my mission for the past years. I still do that, I still very much love uh, that part of the work, but now I also work in good governance and integrity in the sports unit, and uh, for this reason I very much uh, welcome the words of Marieke before that the two are, are linked, and this is precisely how I see it, but also how the European Commission sees it. So good governance from the European Commission perspective. Well, uh, you probably know, and I'm not going to give you now a history lesson, but you probably know that uh, the sport competence at, um, at EU level is relatively new. It was only in, introduced in the Treaty of Lisbon in 2009. But since the very beginning, integrity and good governance have been considered a priority, one of the key areas of work for the European Commission. Um, and the idea was that the, um, our, our role was, and I quote, that of promoting fairness and openness in sporting competitions, promoting cooperation between bodies responsible for sport, and protecting the physical and moral integrity of sportsmen and sportswomen. So that was very much enshrined in our legal Bible, if you want, since the very beginning. Now, of course, here we're talking about soft law and hard law, and uh, you probably know that uh, in terms of uh, sport competencies, uh, we are very much in the realm of, of soft law. Um, we, by, we definitely don't have any EU exclusive competencies. We don't even have shared competencies. But our role is that of support, coordinate, and supplement the work of both member states and sport organizations um, in, in, their, in, in their work. And uh, um, the idea is that there are certain issues, and good governance is definitely one of those, that are not easily tackled at national level, and therefore there is a need for uh, a, broader, uh, a broader intervention at, um, at the EU level. Um, concretely, what, that, that, what does that mean? How does it work? Well, basically, as European Commission, we have a multi-annual work plan agreed with the member states, so at, in, at the moment we are working in the framework 2017-2020. And here you can see briefly that basically we have three priorities. Integrity of sport is very much up there, it's one of our core priorities I would say. And in terms of our instruments, uh, we work for example with two expert groups that gather together experts from all the member states and sport organizations as observers, we call them, but in fact, as far as I'm concerned, they're, they're full members of, of these expert groups. And um, one of these uh, expert groups focuses on integrity. I, I provide the secretariat for that group, and focuses on good governance, anti-corruption, and match, and match fixing. So this, is, this meets uh, about two or three times a year, and um, several times we have heard this throughout the day talking about the importance of changing culture, the importance of um, exchanging practices, the importance of each one of us, um, how each one of us has to do something at their own level, whether it's an EU level, whether it's an international federation, national organization, or grassroots sport. So this is pretty much uh, the kind of uh, 
policy, let's say, that governs our, um, our work in this field. What else uh, can we do? Well, we have a, we have a new instrument from, the, uh, from um, 2017, we have a new instrument, these cluster meetings. And then, of course, we have the usual, you know, we can organize conferences, seminars, we can promote studies if we think that uh, uh, some research is needed in a specific field. Um, what are cluster meetings? Cluster meetings um, gather together all the past winners of Erasmus Plus funding in a specific field. The idea being, after a few years of having worked in this field and having provided funding to different organizations, um, we felt the need, and not just us, clearly the member states supported us, to learn from these projects because, as also was mentioned before, you know, you get funding for one year, for two years, and then what? You know, what happens with all these great tools that are developed? And so the idea of the cluster meetings is to put together all these projects and to really facilitate exchange with all these organizations that are doing amazing things uh, in different countries at different levels. And uh, the next one coming up, 4th and 5th of December, is going to focus on integrity in sport. So it's going to be the first of its kind, and all the past uh, winners, past projects that have benefited from funds in Erasmus pro um, <coughs> projects uh, will be invited together with some, uh, some experts. And the idea is really to, that they learn from each other, but also that we learn from the projects. And we can really make sure that there is a, a return uh, or at the policy level of what, of what was done uh, with uh, taxpayers' money. Um, this year we are also uh, finalizing a, a mapping study on corruption in sport. Uh, this was uh, requested in the context of this expert group on integrity that I mentioned before, because in 2019 the, the rotating presidency of the European Council will, will go to Finland, and Finland wants to focus on corruption in sport in, in their work for the six months. So um, here, of course, I put to be confirmed because I can't speak on behalf of the Finnish government or of the Finnish presidency, but the idea that behind us organizing this mapping study on corruption, which, by the way, will be presented um, on the occasion of the cluster meeting in December, is, was precisely to do some background uh, mapping of what's going on in Europe so that uh, Finland could then um, <coughs> move on and, and produce recommendations uh, at council level based on these uh, on these recommendations. So Erasmus Plus, of course, um, is is also one of the most uh, important tools. Uh, one of the ones that I'm sure you all like the most, <laughs> because nobody says no to funding. And um, I was pleased to hear uh, some good example. Of course, we're all here today because of uh, Erasmus Plus funding, but also when Mareke was mentioning about the new hockey project. And I want to talk about spoilers. That um, <laughs> I'll let uh, Jens uh, conclude with a cliffhanger. But um, uh, it's um, it was the first time with Erasmus Plus that we could really. Um, increase the amount of funds that we could provide to sport organizations. Before that, so before 2014, we only had a very limited amount of money uh, in, that went into the so-called preparatory actions that were also mentioned this morning, this morning. But this is really a bit more structured and, and, and also very steady. You know, we all know that each year there will be a call, sometimes even two, but that was more at the beginning of the process. So the next uh, 2019 call, the deadline typically is around springtime. And uh, I, I wanted to draw your attention to the fact that on the 5th of February 2019, we will have an info day in Brussels. We do it every year, which specifically um, targets sport organizations and universities and, and local uh, authorities uh, on how to apply for EU funds. And not just technically, there is a lot of that. It goes down to the really details of how to submit the successful applications but also from the political point of view, what is it that we want? What are the priorities? What kind of projects uh, do we want? Do we need more projects uh, on good governance? Do we need more projects on gender equality, on health financing, physical activity? Uh, these are the kind of things that uh, are discussed in this meeting. And um, you don't all need to come to Brussels because it's also web streamed. So that is always a very, um, a very uh, successful, successful event. And of course, you might know as well that during these years, so from 2014, the budget has been increasing yearly. 
every year there's, there's more money being put in these projects. And this, to be honest, in the current economic climate is, uh, is a little bit of a miracle that we have managed to uh, still obtain this kind of support from all the member states. Um, so how does it look? Well, concretely, you know, who gets this money? Um, I singled out here some of the topics that uh, are of more interest for us here. So you see the governance, the fight against doping, and the fight against match fixing. Um, yes, they are increasing a little bit, but they're still very low. So uh, for 2018, by the way, the slide is not updated, but uh, for good governance we have eight projects, so the same as last year. For doping we have four projects, so even less. This is definitely an area where we would like to see more projects. And for match fixing, we have one, so 13 in total. So as you can see, you know there's still uh, there's still a lot of scope for to have uh, to have more interesting projects uh, in this in this area. <coughs> what else do we do? Well, from uh, from this one, we go from like the very practical element, the sort of the the money giving and the very concrete way in which we can help uh, on the ground to a more high level political side. So the pledge on good governance was um, uh, one of our highest uh, initiatives from the political point of view. It was personally supported, um, even initiated I would say, by our commissioner, Tibor Navarcic, and uh, was launched during the European Media Sport in 2016. So far, we have uh, 14 signatories, and uh, we are hoping, of course, to get more. It's, it's an ongoing process. Of course, we had a kind of a big of a loud bang in launching the initiative, but uh, it doesn't stop there. You know, as, as you were saying, also for, for, uh, for the UK, you know, it's one thing to have one organization to sign a pledge. It's another thing to see what do we do with this, what does it mean. So the pledge, in a way, really epitomize the soft law approach in the sense that it's an initiative. It keeps it, it keeps the attention of, uh, of all the stakeholders where it should be. But then, of course, uh, like Stan was saying this morning, we don't have any teeth to actually then uh, follow up with the sport organization what they are actually doing with it. That's uh, that's inevitable. But still, I think it's uh, we can't underestimate the importance of these things either. You know, the importance of uh, of uh, high-level initiatives that keep the attention on uh, on, on the topic. Uh, in terms of uh, what next, what do I see coming? Well, of course, we still have several years to go on the EU work plan, so we are still working with, uh, with, especially with the member states in the context, as I mentioned, of the expert group on integrity. Um, personally, I'm very much looking forward to the Finnish presidency. I'm not. Uh, it's not that I don't work well with the current ones, but of course, when the presidency, presidency specifically puts their priority on, on integrity, that of course uh, has the potential of, uh, of making a difference. Um, so we still have Erasmus Plus board, and we are currently very much uh, in the middle of the discussion of, of the next wave of, of Erasmus Plus, the next program, what's going to happen. And the, the current proposal on the table, these things take I mean, you know, you don't need to, to be a law professor to know the intricacies of uh, uh, the role of the European Parliament, the role of the Member States, the role of the Commission, but basically we have a proposal on the table that was tabled at the end of May for a new Erasmus Plus program, and as it is, it doubles the funds. Um, and, in theory, it would also double the funds of the sport part. Uh, this is still all uh, up for discussion, so I can't promise uh, what, uh, uh, what is not there. On the other hand, the proposal is there, and so the, um, the, outlook, the outlook is, uh, is quite good. Um, and then, of course, uh, we want to continue to develop the, the pledge, and we, we were kind of discussing internally how to do that, you know, what kind of initiative would transform this pledge into, into an instrument that is even more impactful, let's say. So it's a good by all means. Um, but by and large, uh, this is pretty much where, where we are situated, and it's very, very much soft law approach. Um, but I think the potential is, is definitely there to uh, exchange good practice and to make everyone work around, around the table from different countries, from different organizations, 
each of us bringing something different to uh, to the advancement of uh, of, of the tournaments. Thank you very much, Paula. We have some time left for questions, so I would like to invite up uh, all the speakers. Do you have any questions or comments? No? Um, uh, Marike and Paula, you both uh, touched upon uh, the gender issue. And uh, we have seen both in the NSGO and the SGO reports that many federations lack a gender equality policy. And of course, many federations also lack a gender balance board. Um, how do we achieve a more gender balanced sport? Marike? Um, yeah, there I think you have to start with the statute, and uh, uh, as we have, as well in MRH as in EHF, we have a certain uh, uh, amount of women uh, uh, members that need to be elected, so in Europe it's uh, from the elected members at least three, and in MRH it's at least four. So that's the way we try to influence the, the composition. But you were talking uh, also about other diversity mm. uh, programs of diversity possibilities in, in, in the board. But that's quite complicated, I can tell you, because you can do, at least in the federations I know, you can ask all kinds of things, but the people elect. And who they elect, maybe that's not exactly the proportion as it is. But with women, we are making the steps. And Paula, I know uh, the Commission has up an objective of increasing the, the women in boards by up to 40% mm -hmm. by 2020. Is it possible? <laughs> well, it's not up to us necessarily, yeah. you know. <laughs> Other people have to do their bit as well. Um, when, when we talk about um, gender equality, we talk about different levels, so each, um, each area, let's say, has different approaches and different needs. The, the one element is for sure leadership, and for sure increasing the numbers to start with. Numbers, and not just having the token woman on the board, but actually giving that woman, who is very capable, I don't believe that, you know, is there just because the woman, give that woman an important role. You know, that's also something that, in terms of quality of, uh, of uh, portfolio, let's say, that women get, that's, that's something that we very much uh, discuss a lot. But there's other ways to increase, the problem is that you have to increase gender equality starting from the very beginning. So you need to propose, to, you need to, to give role models, and, and you were talking about mentors as well. You really need to see the sport, all these discussions about uh, football in, in, on TV, for example. You, 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 have, you have to inspire the new generation that then will come up and will then go, hopefully part of them will go on to, to the management. So you have to work on coaches, for example. And, uh, uh, the, and, and then we have the big issues of gender violence, that of course uh, also is a, is a, is a big talk for us. Yeah. And how about you, Emma, about the code in the UK code, the gender issues, does it play a role there? Yeah, no, of course. So um, there are uh, particular requirements in the code that um, ask for boards to own and have diversity action plans. So we want to know um, how and will and what will the board do to um, increase um, and, and equal out the, the gender imbalance. Um, so that they need to be transparent about their workings. So they would call them diversity action plans as well as having a governance action plan. Um, and, and they need to put that action plan up on their website and be clear about that. But, um, you know, it's, it's not always easy, um, and the sports need uh, support and guidance and, and advice on, on how you do that. So we, we do offer a package of support, so, you know, right from looking at, you know, how you might um, word job description, descriptions or the advertisements and, and make sure you're not excluding anybody or any particular parties and um, looking at kind of um, the panels that recruits on boards and actually what does that panel look yeah. like? Is it made up of <coughs> white middle-aged men, or you know, do you are you kind of practicing what you preach? So, yeah. <laughs> I 
was going to ask a, a similar question um, in relation to cascading leadership. So Tracy Taylor from um, Sydney, Australia. Um, in relation to um, some of the really good examples of where you know, gender um, programs have worked, and with in Australia we've had the male champions of change model that started with the top 50 CEOs in business um, getting behind um, ensuring that women were not only on boards but were in senior leadership positions and were given opportunities um, to be on various panels and committees, etc., and not just token. And then that's cascaded down to sport as well. And every male CEO of a sport, National Sport Federation in Australia, is on the Male Champions of Change, and all the women CEOs are associate members. And I think that's been a, a really successful um, way in which this issue has been um, addressed. And I think there's a, a lot of global examples that are similar. So now that you've stolen my question, uh, maybe I can ask another question, particularly to Emma. So you're probably aware that uh, the Australian Sport Commission and the AIS had the winning edge uh, strategy, which is very similar to what UK Sport um, has in place and what you've presented. And we've thrown that out because it was too compliance based and it wasn't seen as promoting a whole of sport model. So I'm wondering, um, in terms of review of what you're doing, do you see that um, you will be going forward with the way in which you've approached this, but, um, or given the success that you've outlined, is there other ways now of addressing issues of um, good governance in sport that go beyond that compliance structure? Thank you. Um, uh, I mean, I think we must remember that um, boards are membership organisations and, and um, you know, as much as we kind of, uh, we have targets on there and, and board compositions and 25% independence, it's important that, um, you know, the membership are representative, so we still really believe in the voice of council and, and, and what that can do. Um, so, uh, but to address your, your second uh, point and your question about kind of, you know, is that compliance approach the right approach? And I, I think we have seen huge change, but actually I think the next step for us is, um, let's look at the quality of the output now. Um, yes, all of our sports have met all of the 58 code requirements, um, and that's fantastic, and that's a huge step forward. Um, what we really want to do now is, what's the quality of that work and, and how does some of those processes work in practice and, and, and measuring the value there that it's adding to the sector. Thank you. Time is running. Uh, we need to move on to the next part of the session. I would like to say thank you to all speakers. We are definitely running short of time, but we must make sure that we get the last uh, speaker um, to, to have the time that he needs. Actually, I'm a bit sorry that we don't have time for a big introduction because the man deserves many words. Um, he received the Play the Game Award last year together with two uh, very courageous Russian whistleblowers and of course he needs actually no more introduction. Uh, he's If there's one man behind the revelation of one of the biggest, if not the biggest, doping scandal of times, the Russian doping scandal, it's Hayo Seppel. We invited Hayo here to give us his words about the situation right now, four years after he started uh, the snowball running, um, or what to say, but uh, Hayo, please come up and give us your perspective on where things are standing. Hopefully I'm not too exhausted after all the presentations and the speeches and interviews and uh, questions, whatever. Um, to be honest, it's, it's really interesting to, to listen to all the different uh, 
takes and opinions and, re and evaluations. But I have also to say, and it's of course it's it's, it's, uh, it's absolutely uh, uh, important to to underline all the efforts here. But on the other hand, I have to say that if you don't have the mindset, if you don't have the spirit to change something, I believe that, I predict at least, that many things will not happen in the future. We have to network, we have to uh, talk to convince people, but it's really hard. And that is one of the lessons of the last four years. Um, make no mistake. We are not, or you are not the majority of sports. You are still, from my point of view at least, a minority. So most of the people in at least, uh, I would call it traditional sports, are still the same, or not very different. If you compare it four years ago, or 10 years ago, or 20 years ago, I don't see a difference. And what we learned from the last four years, from my point of view, when it started almost uh, yeah, 48 months uh, ago, what we learned is uh, two things. The first thing, from my point of view, is that the sports is in a state, the whole sports system globally is in a state which I would call anachronistic, I would call it feudal, I would call it absolutely not appropriate for all the different challenges we face and we have faced. That's one thing. The other thing is that we have now a growing number of people who have identified the problem and who are now trying to establish, I would call it a, a kind of opposition group in, in, in the sports domain, the global sports domain, to, to make things better. But there's another, there's a third point, which I think is also necessary to say <coughs> publicly and and to repeat it wherever you can, wherever I can. It means that many of, sorry I have to say that, many of these people who are really fighting seriously and trustworthy and are honest and good people, there are some of them uh, also in the sports system, they are powerless. And they are powerless because the, the big key figures of international sports, um, for example, Thomas Bach, they have absolutely no interest to change the system. And what, that's what we should have in mind and should have, must understand. We can talk, we can have many debates about all of this, but have always in mind that we're talking about more or less 200 countries globally. We are talk about, we are talking about many NOCs, we are talking about international federations, we are talking about anti-doping agencies and the vast majority of these, from my point of view and from my experience, is not so much interested to change a lot. Because why should they? The system works. The sports system works still. There are some challenges, talking about Olympic bidding cities, for example, that, or referendums, which are a huge risk for, for the IOC in the current situation. But in general, they get so much money from TV licenses, from TV rights. It's still, still a system which is in a, in a way solid. That's what you have to accept. So why should they really change? There are some challenges, as I said. A growing number of athletes, for example, worldwide, was, was criticizing the way, for example, WADA is dealing with the whole issue. And that leads me to the World Anti-Doping Agency. And if you compare the situation four years ago with today, then what we know from 2014 was that WADA was aware of really crucial problems within the Russian anti-doping system. Because there was a courageous whistleblower, Vitaly Stepanov, and his wife, Yulia Stepanova, who had at that point already had delivered a lot of evidence to the World Anti-Doping Agency. And they said in 2014, we had not the possibility, we had not <coughs> the legal framework in order to react. My point of view on that is, that this is only partially correct. I know that the WADA 
code at that point was not as good, I don't know if I could say as good, as, let's say as efficient as it is nowadays. But it doesn't explain why WADA failed in the years before 2014 to address that issue in a proper way, because the emails from Vitaly Stepanov already existed in the headquarters of the World Anti-Doping Agency in Montreal. There would have been many opportunities to act. For example, to pay a visit to Russia, or maybe not even one visit, maybe several visits, to make pressure via the media, to hold press conferences, to address that issue publicly. They didn't do that. And that tells me a lot about WADA. And if you see it in the course of the last four years, there are still some issues which we have to address. And I don't talk about the investigation led by Günther Janger, for example, who is now heading the investigation intelligence department within WADA. I don't talk about the work of Richard McLaren, the so-called independent person. I don't talk about Richard Pound, who led the investigation. I talk about the top key figures within WADA. The problem is, so as Travis Tiger, as you, many of you uh, are aware of, he is uh, um, the CEO of the U.S. Anti-Doping Agency. He calls it always the Fox and the House debate. Um, I would say it absolutely doesn't work at all. That an IOC member who has clear commercial interests in order to promote the Olympic business is at the same time President of the World Anti-Doping Agency. It simply doesn't work. And if you see how Craig Reedy, a person, has reacted on several occasions with respect to Russia, then you have to say, okay, they led investigations, but only due to pressure of national anti-doping agencies and only due to the fact that he wanted to avoid political um, concerns. That is what really happened. So there was no real appetite, there was no taste to, 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 to address that issue in a proper and in a necessary way. And there are some examples, and ARD is working on that, to, and we are still investigating on that um, in the moment, where you clearly could see that what the staff members within WADA, for example, or within some federations, federations, IFs have been done, is not the same how the president was reacting. And from my point of view, WADA was in a kind of sandwich position. That means there have been some stakeholders from, from the political uh, side, for example, the uh, current candidate for the presidency was in WADA next year, Linda Hellerland from Norway. And there have been others from the Olympic movement. The unfortunately late Patrick Baumann from Switzerland, or Hugo Erdner from Turkey, who uh, represent the Olympic movement on the WADA Foundation Board, and sorry, the Executive Board. Um, if you have followed their way to approach this issue, it was completely clear from the beginning that they wanted to get Russia reinstated as soon as possible. But what we are talking about is, the, from my point of view, and coming from Germany, I know how state-run doping was working because I was working as a journalist investigating on East German state-run doping in the 80s and 70s. So um, I'm really informed about that. The only system you can compare with, with the East German doping system, was the Russian doping system. And we're talking about the biggest country in the world. We're talking about state-sponsored doping by people in the government. And to address that issue is very different to whatever, individual doping in the United States, for example, or individual doping in some countries. It is a simple, different level. So, WADA should have addressed, from my point of view, this issue in a much, much more trustworthy, reliable, and stringent and compelling way. And I have the feeling that the top officials in WADA failed to do so, and that brought us and brought the anti-doping movement, the whole anti-doping movement in a situation at the very end where it was really complicated how to continue, how to proceed here. Because if the IOC, for example, reinstates 
the Russian Olympic Committee allows them to compete at the Olympics. And as you might remember, Thomas Bach, for me, the grave digger of anti-doping uh, globally uh, for years, um, he said they want to draw a line under the whole scandal after the Pyeongchang Olympics. So at that point, it was clearly very complicated for for WADA to react and to still resist or like, insist that they stick to the roadmap. It was not that easy. There was so much pressure. The problem is the IOC, but the problem is also Mr. Reedy, who currently harshly criticizes, for example, David Holman, the former director general of WADA, because he criticized the WADA policies in, uh, nowadays. But if you ask him for a word about Thomas Bach, there's nothing, because he's wearing two hats. And that shows us, and that's what I can say from my experience, that shows us after four, four years, if we draw a line and see it at the bottom line, that the state of sports is worrying, is still worrying, it's not better or worse than four years before. We see a lot of athletes who are currently criticizing the system but have not much power. So we see also two, uh, in German I would call it two trains, who uh, um, going in, uh, bump to each other up if you don't, if you don't finish that debate soon. On the other hand, I think it's time, it's also time for, for people to wake up or to see that. So if I sum up all what has happened in the last four years, I would say we have really experienced and have seen how weak is the sports system to challenge the system, uh, to challenge uh, the, the obvious, obvious issues we have. <coughs> and we have also seen how autocratic, how feudal, how anachronistic the sports governance is still. One last example, to be honest, I was not always focusing on that, but it came into my mind a couple of months ago, and weeks ago, when I realized, can you imagine, that athletes who are the core of sport, without athletes, sports doesn't work. They have no voting right on the water executive board. Can you imagine that? <laughs> it's simply ridiculous. And they're still telling us, okay, well, we have to see that, we have to see that from a global and bigger and broader perspective, we will deal with that issue. But we are in 2018. We have prof professional sports all over the place, and it's still the fact that athletes cannot decide on their own destiny, on their own face within water. It's time to wake up, and that is a lesson of the last four years to understand that the sports system, how it is, how it is currently in state, <coughs> cannot last forever in this way. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mayu. Um, unfortunately, I think we will not have time for questions for you, but I'm also convinced that we will hear more from you uh, in the future and keep up the good work. Thanks a lot for everything you've done so far. And to continue from where Hayu just left us, um, although the cliffhanger has sort of been <laughs> disclosed already, but uh, it was supposed to be a surprise or at least a, a revelation that we are able to continue the work of the, the past two years with the National Sports Governance Observer. But now, going forward uh, within the anti-doping uh, area to see if we can solve some of the problems of conflict of interest and independence and the fox scanning the hen house and what have you. Um, Play the Game has created uh, a project application to the Erasmus Plus program and we've been successful with that application so we'll be doing this 
NATGO project um, from next year on and going until 2020. We will do that in cooperation with Anout, of course. Um, we need him on board and we will build, as I said, on the experience we have and the results we have from the National Sports Governance Observer. Um, but we will try to, um, to, to look at national anti-doping organizations. We've been granted 216,000 euros, so it's not a huge amount of money, but we will see what we can do with it in the best way. We will um, adjust the tool that we have been using for, for national sports federations to anti, uh, national anti-doping organizations. It, it, a lot of the work that has been done already can be built upon, but we need to, uh, to modify the tool so it adapts to, uh, to, to NADOs. We will kick off the project uh, in February next year with a meeting with all partners. And I'm really happy to, uh, to be presenting all the partners here. They are, oops, they are three universities. Uh, University of Warsaw that we have worked with in the, net, in the NSGO project, KU Leuven, as I said, and then um, the, the German Sports University in Cologne. Then we will be working with five national agencies. And uh, most importantly, and I'm really happy that we've been able to secure athlete representation on the project. So Paulina, EU athletes, will be part of the project consortium, as will Fair Sport, that you might know, um, headed by Johan Koss and Claudia Boku. So that's really um, enlightening to have athletes on board, and we will do um, some surveys among elite athletes to, to hear their views on, on the governance in, in anti-doping. So it's, it's really a pleasure, and thanks to uh, the, uh, no, not that you, Paula, but uh, we're really happy that we succeeded with this uh, project application, and you'll hear more about it uh, as, we, as we get closer. And anyone interested? To participate in some way, uh, Herman, you're welcome. Uh, others as well. So just just uh, stay in touch. Yep. And now to the closing, I think. Of the uh, yes, I think also I thought when when seeing these slides, actually, if we didn't have the Erasmus Plus program, what stage would we be in? How many issues would not be covered? by this extremely rich industry, the sport industry. The, I think the main problem is that the power structures are so uniform and so hierarchical, so there is, there is not competition between powers, there is only competition in, of power inside the organizations, and all kind of dissent is marginalized still and that's uh, really thought-provoking so thank you for to the now you can receive on behalf of the whole European Union you can uh, receive our thanks and this program exists what I would like to see and that say be very honest about that uh, it was not only to kickstart projects but that for instance now we can see that the NSGO has a legitimacy it has an impact it would be wonderful if we could do not have to run around for sponsors, uh, donations, foundations, so we could make it uh, more sustainable. But that's another discussion, and I might go to the, deliver these complaints here, perhaps at the cluster meeting in, in, in uh, uh, December. Um, it's, I, th I think there are a few things uh, I would say. Uh, Hi-O, the reason why we invited uh, you, yeah, where? Oh, you yeah. left. Uh, uh, the reason why we invited uh, Hayo was also to say that yes, we do still need active, hard-working journalists. Uh, Antoine du uh, Duval from ASA Sports Institute, you also left, yes, but raised the question of uh, why, didn't, why don't the journalists uh, uh, take on uh, cash? What about the ethics committees? And I couldn't add Yes, and what about all the international sports federations that go under the public radar because they are not in charge of a globally exposed sport? I mean, FIFA and football is just like the king of everything. 
What about taking a look into volleyball? What about taking a deeper look into what's happening in swimming? What about all this? Yes, there are a lot of evidence that journalists should produce, but the situation of the print media is not very easy. The situation of the electronic media is that they are very often buying these rights at a very high price, so they have an inherent conflict of interest. If you have paid 200 million US dollars for a good show, do you want to ruin it by having uh, uh, journalists running around and, and uh, digging up uh, uh, problems? That's not evident. I'm not saying it cannot be balanced. We have seen the German, the German TV. So I would like, not only, I, we will always encourage and push for better journalism, that's why we started, but I would like to pass the baton on also to <coughs> academic researchers and to everyone else who is in a position where you can get knowledge, where you can gather evidence. Don't stop at the theory. Don't stop there. Help getting the facts. It is not the academic researchers that has driven the political, sports political agenda because they have very rarely uncovered what is really going on. We can use academic research for a lot of things like we have seen the whole today and I appreciate it a lot. But there could, you could take a step further, although of course it would perhaps be a little bit risky sometimes. But maybe there is a dependence also, a structural dependence between the academic researchers who are dependent on grants, not from the EU, from the sports institutions themselves. This is just the world we live in. I would just encourage that we keep on working together. And let me say very specifically, there are a number of areas we should work on now. I have mentioned all these, uh, I would almost say, unknown or under the radar uh, uh, federations. We have heard about the credibility of the anti-doping struggle and the inner struggles in the whole anti-doping system right now. We have also today discussed one thing, and I feel that we have not explored at all, is what is the athlete voice? What is athlete representation? How do we express this best? Because there is also another challenge when we talk about athlete voice, we are always talk about elite athlete's voice. And I think this is simply an open question to us all, how can we improve the, the voices, the, 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 the uh, framework for voices of athletes. Hayo mentioned opposition. Yes, opposition, maybe, because sometimes the sports world needs opposition, but sometimes if we are only in opposition, we may only reflect that part of sports reality and forget about the wider sport reality that is outside the Olympic system and that could be a source of democratization of sport in combination with sometimes uh, opposition. We have the question of government relations to the so-called autonomous sports world. I prefer the word freedom of association because when you say sports autonomy, you sort of indicate that everything that has to do with sport should be autonomous, but it shouldn't because when sport becomes a business, it can no longer claim the rights of protection that civil society can have. So all these issues and many more, we look forward to continue to discuss with you there is a possibility for researchers and other stakeholders to engage in the National Sports Governance Observer Partnerships. We have an open call. If you, cover, if you are from countries that are not yet covered, or if you want to support or make partnerships in those countries that are covered. And we have, and that would be the last pitch, Play the Game 2019. I'm sure we'll embrace many of these issues. We will, for the first time, go to the United States, go outside Europe for the first time. It will be in Colorado Springs from, two, uh, from uh, 13th to 16th October next year. And so start making your savings for the flight tickets that will be a little more expensive than going to learn for most of you now that you are not from the EU, except perhaps for Ryan Gochev who is coming from Canada. But uh, um, we really hope that you will see, and may I, don't, don't lean back, 
and wait for us to make an interesting program. If you register for our free newsletter at playthegame.org, you will receive our call for papers, call for proposals. You can actually shape the content of Play the Game 2019. And we would very much welcome your proposals. With that, I would like to thank our guests and speakers for the contribution, for the really information-packed uh, day to the audience for now, not only for your presence, but also for your patience. And uh, uh, to my colleagues who have really contributed spiritually, materialistically, and uh, organizationally to uh, making this uh, uh, day uh, come through. And uh, I now wish uh, you all safe travels back home and uh, continued engagement in the better governance of sport. Thank you. Thank you.